877-700-0559. I get all those numbers right now. You give us a call, give us your name, address, include the zip code. We will send you lesson number one. Study the Bible. That's what we encourage folks to do. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Why I love the Church of Christ. Now, you know, you say, well, I guess, Brother Ake, if you your parents taught you to love the Church of Christ. Well, they did. I want you to look at this terminology for a second. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter number 5, verses 23 through 27. Now, when we read what the Bible says, then I'm going to come back, and I want you to look at the terminology. The Bible says, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I want you to look at something. The Lithia Springs Church of Christ. Let me tell you what that means. That means that there is a church, and the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means called out. Lithia Springs Church of Christ simply means that there are called out individuals who recognize Christ as the head of his body who worship at the Lithia Springs location. See, the word Church of Christ is not a denominational name. You know, so many times folks say, well, what, what denomination? You're not a denomination. A denomination means division. And so when you look at the terminology, here's what it means. Simply the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. So when I make this statement, why I love the church of Christ. Now, certainly I love the Lithia Springs local congregation. I love the churches of Christ worldwide. But I want you to look at this again when you look at that terminology. Why I love the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. It is His. It's not mine. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, all right? Now, I'm going to give you three reasons as you and I study this lesson today. Number one, I love the church that belongs to Christ because of what Christ said about the church. Well, Christ, what did he say about it? Matthew 16, 18 now, in this chapter, you remember, uh, if you go back to verse number 13, Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some said, Well, thou art Elias, or John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. And so Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And in verse 18 he said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now here's why I love the church that belongs to Jesus Christ because of what he said. Listen to what he said. He said, I will build my church. It's personal. It's not John the Baptist. It's not some man, well, we're going to exalt man and put man's name on it. You drive by church buildings and it's got, it's got the, the name of a man on the building. It's got the man's name on a denomination. It has man's concept. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Not man. Not John the Baptist. Now, now watch this. But now we could use other terminology, but I'm going to use the Bible. In Matthew chapter 16, remember who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, Elias or John the Baptist or one of the prophets. Now watch this. Jesus said this is my church. It's not John the Baptist church. It's not Elijah's church. It is not Jeremiah's church. It is not one of the prophets. It is my church. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 11, the Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Who founded the church you're part of? I'd like to ask you that question. I heard a sermon one time that is your, how old is your religion? See, if your church was founded and you base your religion on the Old Testament, it's too old. 
It's too old. That Old Testament was done away. If you base your church, and, you're, and I'm using that in the denominational sense, and you base it, I mean, well, uh, Brother Acuff, well, our church was founded in 1455. Our church was founded in 625 A.D. Our church was founded in 1790. My friend, it's too young. It's too young. The Bible says other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And Peter said that he is the chief cornerstone. See, the clear claim of ownership, Christ Jesus, he is the head of it. He said, I will build my church. It's going to belong to me. Now, that's why the terminology, Church of Christ, that's why that terminology is there, because it belongs to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, so when you and I look at this, and we understand that, and we understand the ownership, so I love the church of Christ, my friend, because of what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my... See those I and my? Not Elijah, not Jeremiah, not John the Baptist. And you look at our denominational world today, I'm going to tell you, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. These folks go out here and get a building and put a name on it. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with Christ. It doesn't exalt Christ. It doesn't mention His name. Some of them mention men's name. Number two, why do I love the church? Because of what Christ did for the church. Now, number one, we said because of what Christ did said about the church. Matthew 16, 18. Now, number two, because of what Christ did for the church. Now, in Ephesians 5, 25, the Bible said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and did what? And gave Himself for it. He gave Himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so when you and I look at this and understand what did he do? Well, number one, folks, he ransomed the church. Now, in the book of Matthew chapter number 20 and verse number 28, the Bible said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. He did what? He gave His life a ransom for many. See, man sin. Man is separated from God because of sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that He cannot reach, neither are His ears heavy that He cannot hear, but your sin has separated between you and God. And so man is separated from God because of this barrier of sin. In Romans chapter number 3, verse 10, there are none righteous, no, not one. In verse number 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John chapter 1, if a man says he has no sin, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John 3, verse 4, the Bible said sin is transgression of the law. And so what happens? Man belongs to the death. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible says, Know ye not that to whom, listen to this, whom you use, Yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now, you and I are servants of whom we obey. So what took place? Well, man sinned. Go back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter number 3. And Eve ate of the fruit that God said, thou, The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. She ate of that fruit. And so the Bible said, Wherefore by one man, listen to this, for wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, therefore death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Well, as a, as a sinner, who do you belong to? Well, you belong to the devil. See, that's what, happened, that's what sin does. It separates a man from God. So what did Jesus do? He ransomed us. He bought us back. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 6, the Bible said, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. See, this idea, people have, they say, well now, uh, you know, if someone, take someone captured, okay? They abduct someone, and so they've got them, and they send you a ransom note. We will let your, we will let your, relative go if you will send us a million dollars. We'll set up a time, you give us a million dollars, and they can go, okay? That person been abducted, and you, and you love your loved one, you want them back, you don't say, well, I'll just go ahead and shoot them. No, you don't do that. 
So what you do is you say, well, okay, now you're gonna, you, want, you want to try to get them back. And so what are you going to do? You're going to pay the ransom for it. Satan took control of man by sin. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to buy him back. I'm going to pay the price. Now, Erdman's Bible Dictionary defines ransom uh, as a price paid to release a captive or seized property or the act of procuring release uh, in this particular manner. So, a price paid to release a captive. See, now here's the thing you and I need to find out. Not only uh, have we been bought back, not only have we been uh, redeemed, not only have we been ransomed, not only been ransomed, all right, Secondly, not only ransomed, but reconciled in the church. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. The Bible says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. See, here is sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. We've mentioned that several times. Sin has separated between man and God. Here's, here, here is God and here is man, and man is separated from God. Jesus Christ gave His life a ransom in order that man may then be reconciled to God. Now, in Romans 5 verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is, again, bringing two separate individuals back together who were separated for a particular reason. In the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 18, we read 16 and 17 a minute ago, I know you not to whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, as servants you are to you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, you are the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Now listen to this next verse, 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now watch this. Man has been taken over by Satan because of sin. Jesus Christ comes along and He has ransomed us. He has paid that part. Now then, because of the price that has been paid, a man can be reconciled unto God. Now, let me give you a third thing, and I think draw this all up in a, in a nice bow. He redeemed the church. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and spot. Now, Ephesians 1, verse 7. The Bible said, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In Matthew chapter number 1, in verse number 21, the Bible says, when it, in announcing the birth of Jesus, the Bible said, He shall save His people from their sins. In John 1, in verse number 29, John, in his introduction to Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Then Paul, in 1 Timothy 1, verse number 15, said, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. All right? Now, when you and I look at this, so what do we, I love the church of Christ because of what Jesus said about it in Matthew 16 and 18, I will be on my church. I love the church of Christ because of what Jesus did for the church because He gave His life a ransom. Now, I must submit to His will. You know what? You've been, you've been abducted. You've been captured. Somebody pays the ransom and you, yeah, no, man, you got to be crazy. I like it where I am, huh? See, that's what many are saying in the world today. See, people have this idea called universal salvation. Well, because Christ died on the cross, shed His blood, I can just basically do whatever I want to do to make any difference. God's going to save me anyhow, and therefore everything is just going to be right, and I'll do whatever it is I want to do. you got to keep something in mind, my friend. You have to make a conscious choice and a conscious decision to accept the pardon that has been given to you. A pardon, and I probably should document this and could, but a pardon, is, a pardon is no good if the person doesn't accept it. Christ redeemed, reconciled, ransomed us. 
But my friend, listen, unless I am willing to submit to His will, notice this. The Bible says He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have... Well, now, back up. Because here's the kicker. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom, into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Where is that blood administered in His kingdom when you're baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? In the book of Acts, chapter number 2, you remember on the day of Pentecost? If you don't remember, go read Acts chapter number 2. They had crucified the Son of God. And so Peter said, You with wicked hands crucified the Son of God. They cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know what the Bible says in verse 47? And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. All right, now go back with Neil, my analogy. You've been captured, all right? You've been abducted by the devil. God sent his son, and God said, I'm going to let my son die as the cost in order for you to be reconciled, redeemed, and ransomed. I'm going to let my son pay that price. Now then, when you look at Colossians chapter number 1 and you see that we have been uh, delivered of the power of darkness and we've been translated where? Into the kingdom. Now, my friend, salvation is in Christ in His body. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bi Listen, in Ephesians chapter 5, remember the Bible says He is the Savior of the body. So I'm challenging you. When you I, love, I, love the, I love the church that Jesus built. I love the church that Jesus bought because of what He said in Matthew 16, 18 and because of what He did in Ephesians 5, 23 through 27. Now, I want to go to the third thing. I love the church of Christ because of what Christ promised the church. You ever had somebody make a promise to you? Now look at this. We, we quoted this earlier, Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to underline that phrase. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Boy, isn't that powerful? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell, I don't care what they do. I don't care what the devil does. It doesn't matter how strong he thinks he is. He will not prevail against the church. Now, my friend, if you want to receive a, a, secure, a secure situation, you know, we're confronted throughout our world. Men are confronted. They never know when ISIS may occur. They never know when some terrorist may occur and, and, and just begin to, to shoot folks down or to drive a vehicle in a crowd. Now, if I could say to you, now we go to malls, we go to shopping centers or, or to uh, restaurants, we go to sporting events. I want to ask you a question. If, if I could guarantee you and you believe that guarantee, that doesn't matter where you go. You go to any mall, you go to any restaurant, you go to any sporting event, I will guarantee you it doesn't make a difference. They will not be able to get to you. What would be your reaction? Well, let me tell you something, folks. There's a place like that spiritually, and that is the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Satan has no power, and he cannot penetrate it. Now, you and I can leave it, this, comes, this doctrine, once in grace, always in your own, once saved, always saved, is not a doctrine of the Bible. That is a doctrine of man. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 24, Then the end shall come, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom unto God, even the Father. So when you and I recognize that it is within the church, number one, salvation is there. Protection is there. 
The presence of Christ is there. God's love is there. And so when you and I recognize this, now the end, folks, let me tell you, the end is going to come. One of two things is going to happen. Larry Acuff is going to die one of these days. Larry Acuff, uh, you know, do you think, well, I, I, you know, I think, no, I'm going to live to be 500, 5,000. No, no, no. The day will come when I will die. Or Christ will return. One or the other. One or the other is going to take place, folks. Now notice this. In Ephesians 5 and verse number 27. Now we looked at 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then the end shall come. In Ephesians 5, 27, the Bible said that he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now watch this. In Acts chapter number 2, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. The end of time is going to come. What is he going to do? He's going to take this glorious, precious body that he died for. And he is going to lift it up and present it to God. See, the Lord's promises, folks, are exceeding great and precious. 1 Peter 1 verse 4. When you and I consider this, what is Christ going to do? The Bible says the end's going to come, that he's going to do what? Present it to himself. It may be presented. You know what the Bible said? Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, him will I deny also before my Father which is in heaven. And so when you and I recognize it, I love the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. I love the church that belongs to Jesus Christ because of what he said in Matthew 16, 18. I love the uh, church of Jesus Christ because of what he did in Ephesians 5. I love the church of Christ because it will stand into eternity. Now, my friend, listen to this. Are you in that church? Have you been saved? If you have not, then let me encourage you, hearing the Word of God, upon hearing the Word of God, you believe it, and upon your faith in Christ Jesus as the Son of God, then you make a change in your life, repent of your sins, confess His name before men, and then upon that confession, you be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Once you are in the body of Jesus Christ, remain faithful. The Bible says, be thou faithful unto death. I'll give you a crown of life. Jesus said, he that endure to the end shall be saved. Now there are those who don't. There are those, I mean, uh, folks, there are those who say, well, look, I'm not going to do it any longer. So when you and I look at this, see, because of what Christ promised the church, I want to go to heaven. You know what the Bible says in Acts 2.47? We've read it. The Lord added to the church daily who? Those that were being saved. Now, those of you out here in our audience today who are listening to this program, you have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. You are not a Christian. You've never been a part of the church. My friend, let me say this. I say it because I love you. Not trying to be unkind, not trying to be a mean in any sort of the way. I'm telling you this because you're lost. You're lost. And as a result of that, unless you change and repent and confess and are baptized and live faithful, then my friend, you will spend eternity in hell, a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not uh, put out. The Bible says the smoke of the torment set up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. I love the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for watching our program today. Our prayer is that God will bless you. The poet John Donne wrote, To an incompetent judge I must not lie, but I may be silent. To a competent I must answer. There were times when Jesus was on trial that he answered nothing. When the chief priests accused him of many things, in Pilate's presence Jesus answered nothing. Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, and he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priest and scribe stood and vehemently accused him. Luke 23, 9 and 10. What good would it have done for Jesus to have defended himself before these judges, blinded by prejudice and pride? This one who was incompetently judged in his day will competently judge us in the last day. Before him, we cannot be silent. We must answer for our deeds. I'm Jim Dearman. 
with a brief message of truth for the world. Welcome to a time of Bible readings and hymns with your host, David Kenny of the Wadsworth Church of Christ on West Good Avenue in Wadsworth, Ohio. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. It's 11 o'clock. This is WJHF LP, Florence, Alabama, 106.9 FM. Brought to you by the Jackson Heights Church of Christ, where you'll hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the gospel truth. It's 46 degrees. If you have children living at home, let me encourage you to go get them and let them watch today's episode of The Truth in Love. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out, bring it out, bring it out. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Bring it out, bring it out, bring it out. Bring out, bring the word. Speed it away, Lord, I'd like to thank you for joining us today on The Truth in Love. We are nearing the end of our series of lessons called Fortifying Our Families. And today we're turning our attention to the responsibilities of children in the home. We've had a lesson on what good fathers are supposed to do in the home, what good mothers are supposed to do. And now we turn our attention to the kids. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3. And I know speaking personally that two of the greatest gifts that God has blessed our family with are my two sons. And uh, I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful uh, that God has blessed me and my wife with them. But children are no different from uh, wives and husbands in the sense that they have a role to play in the home. And they have responsibilities that have been placed upon them by God. And uh, we're going to be studying that today by specifically looking at the advice given to young people by Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon spent a large portion of his life, evidently, uh, based on what the book of Ecclesiastes tells us, that uh, he spent a large portion of his life uh, trying to find meaning to life, trying to find what life's purpose was. And uh, he addressed that, or at least uh, uh, introduced us to that question and that issue in the early verses of chapter 1. What profit is there uh, in all of the toil that man does under the sun, uh, from chapter 1, verse 3. And so Solomon tried to find an answer to that question. What profit is there to the things that we do? What gain is there? What, what is life's meaning? What is its purpose? And he had the ability and the money to look wherever he wanted to. And you learn from the book that he did. He, he tried everything. And uh, he reached a conclusion that life under the sun, a phrase that he uses often in the book, which simply refers to life uh, without God in the picture, without God in the mix. Life under the sun, he said, is vanity. It's a uselessness. He said it's like trying to catch and capture the wind. And in reading that, some folks may get the, the idea that life is just not worth living. But that's not the, the idea that Solomon wants to get across. He's simply saying that life that's pursued without God as a part of it is a worthless endeavor. But if you have God in your life, then, uh, then that makes all the difference in the world. You can live life and pursue uh, whatever uh, enjoyment that you can get out of life. Uh, chapter 2, verse 24, put God in his proper place, and, uh, and then life will ultimately have its greatest meaning. And from those particular principles in the book of Ecclesiastes, there are a lot of things that 
young people especially need to learn without having to learn those lessons the hard way. See, Solomon learned those lessons the hard way. He, uh, he experimented with various things to try to find purpose and meaning to life, and he, he didn't find it in those things. And the fact that he recorded his search for us enables us to learn the lessons that he learned the hard way. We can learn them the easy way. And Solomon has some things to say to young folks near the end of the book. And I hope you have your Bibles there and you'll open them to the book of Ecclesiastes and specifically chapter 11. And we'll look at the last few verses of chapter 11 and the first few verses of chapter 12. And what Solomon hoped that young people would do, uh, and certainly what I hope that you as a young person will do, is to learn these lessons so that you don't waste a lot of the years of your life chasing things that never satisfy. And, uh, and, and through that process, you miss out on what true enjoyment of life is all about. So what did Solomon say specifically to young people? Consider these points. Number one, Solomon teaches in Ecclesiastes 11 that young people should enjoy being young. Look at chapter 11, verse number 9, and the first part of verse number 10. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. So Solomon says at the very outset, Rejoice, young person, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Though some people don't believe it, God does want you to enjoy your life. God is not opposed to people, young or old, having a good time. God's not opposed to enjoyment. Some people have the false idea about God, and, and uh, I suspect that's probably more prevalent among young folks, that they have this concept of God that God just wants to stifle good times, that God wants to stifle enjoyment. God doesn't want people to be happy, that he uh, has his place up in heaven looking down at the people uh, of earth, uh, just uh, trying to figure out ways to keep them from enjoying life. Well, that may be a somewhat popular view of God, but it's certainly not the picture that the Bible paints of God. Uh, where we came up with that idea that God doesn't want us to enjoy life, I don't know. The Bible's clear. God wants you to, to enjoy life. So he says, rejoice, young man. Uh, rejoice, young person, in your youth. Uh, the Bible is filled with ingredients that will bring us a happy, enjoyable life. You recall all those passages in the Bible, and there are many of them, that start with the phrase, blessed is the person who does this. Blessed are the people who does this, that, or the other. The Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, is one uh, example of those. That word blessed comes from a Greek word that could be translated happy. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord, the psalmist said. And when Jesus gave those instructions, those Beatitudes in Matthew 5, where he said, for example, blessed are the pure in heart. Happy are the pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8. Uh, God wants us to be happy, and he gives us the prescription for a happy life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, He that would love life and see good days, let him do the following. And there's a number of things that are listed there in verses 10 through 12. But my point is, the, the first part of that verse says that God wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to love life and see good days. So don't ever buy into this false concept that God doesn't want you to be happy. He does. But where most people miss the boat is that they think that because if they accept the fact that God wants them to be happy, then they want to pursue happiness in their own way. But God knows what will make us the happiest. And he tells us what that is. Now, we've got to trust him that he knows what he's talking about. And then if we'll obey him, we'll have the happiest possible life that we can have. Not only here, but certainly in eternity when this life is over. I can't uh, 
count how many times my parents said to me as I was uh, growing up, these are the best times of your life, so enjoy it. Uh, usually that was stated when I was probably complaining about something and and thinking that my life was uh, you know was just one uh, big long series of unhappy circumstances and it wasn't the case now I, th I thought it was from time to time but my folks reminded me and wanted me to believe though I had a hard time believing it that those growing up years would be uh, you know should be the happiest times because there's so many things about uh, adulthood that you have to, to to be concerned about, and and that um, uh, you know that that you have, that you end up worrying about that you don't have to worry about when you're a kid. And they wanted me to believe that. And as an adult, I can tell you they're right. They were they were 100% correct. And so I would encourage you as a young person to recognize that and trust that and believe that. And enjoy this period of time in your life when you're young. God wants you to do that. But right after saying that, back to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11, after he says, rejoice in your youth, he adds quickly, and I don't think it was by accident that he did, he added uh, near the, um, the end of verse 9, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. So don't lose sight of judgment to come in your pursuit of happiness and joy. Uh, the admonition to rejoice in your youth is not a blank check. It doesn't mean that God approves of whatever pursuit you may engage in to try to bring yourself happiness. Uh, he's simply saying rejoice in your, in your youth, find the joy and happiness that can be yours as a young person, but know that whatever you choose to pursue, you're going to answer for that. And uh, the Bible's clear about that day of reckoning that's coming. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ uh, to be rewarded based upon the things that we've done while in the body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Each one shall give an account of himself unto God. Romans 14, verse 12. And if we'll jump ahead of ourselves in the book of Ecclesiastes, we'll notice in chapter 12, verse 14. Solomon says that God will bring every work into judgment, uh, whether good or bad, including the secret things. So we need to remember that, uh, that enjoying life is a pursuit to be made within the confines of God's authoritative word. Some people think that being destructive uh, and being mean and uh, doing evil things are, are, are things that, that bring... Uh, the most enjoyment and that you really can't have much fun or enjoyment living the life of a Christian. Well, that's just not true. There is great joy to be had in living the Christian life. And those that, uh, that have claimed to be Christians but, but said that there was no enjoyment in that life need to do one of two things. They either need to really pursue the Christian life, because I suspect they didn't, or two, reorient their thinking with regard to what's right and what's wrong and find the joy that exists in doing what's right. But then let me add just a side point to uh, parents, uh, especially those that have younger children. It's an important thing for kids to be able to be kids. Uh, we seem to, in our, in our culture, to place a lot of pressure sometimes on uh, on young kids to, uh, to grow up too fast, uh, physically, socially, academically, uh, spiritually. Sometimes uh, we want our kids to grow up faster than really they need to. Let your kids be kids. And it's hard to know where to, where to draw the line with that. Not everybody's going to draw it in the same place. But youth should be a time for enjoying life. Again, within the confines of biblical authority, but, uh, but there's much enjoyment to be had within those borders. So young people, enjoy your youth. And enjoy your youth with the full recognition that you will answer for your choices one day, just like all of us will. Now, in the second place, uh, I would add to that uh, a similar point that, that kind of builds on the first one, where Solomon says in chapter 11, the latter part of verse number 10, 
remove evil from your heart. So in the same sense in which we can and should rejoice in our youth and enjoy it according to God's will, he also says remove evil uh, from your flesh. Remove evil from your heart. Youthful carelessness can contribute to a lot of sorrow. That's why we need to, to take special care to stay away from that which is evil because the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs uh, uh, 13, 15. And, uh, you know, selecting friends poorly can bring a lot of sorrow into your life. Evil companionships corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. And so there are a lot of things that sometimes become a part of uh, the, the lives of young people that we need to be careful about and remove ourselves from evil influences. That's the best way to be happy, is to stay away from that which is evil. Childhood and youth are fleeting, as Solomon says in verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 11. So don't waste your youthful years on things that are only going to bring you grief. And in that sense, you can learn a lot from, from those of us that are adults, that have been through our period of youth, that have made our mistakes, and uh, hopefully learned from them. We should spend a lot more time, young people should spend a lot more time listening to the advice and wisdom of those that are older so that you don't go through and make the same mistakes that some of us made. So enjoy being young, remove evil from your heart. And then as we get into chapter 12, verse 1, uh, Solomon makes this admonition. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Serving God is not something confined just for the elderly. Serving God is not confined just to uh, adults, older people. The Bible speaks of a lot of people who served God in, uh, in their youth. I think of names like Joseph and Samuel. Uh, think of young David and Josiah and Daniel and others. The Bible mentions who were on the youthful side of, uh, of the age estimations. They were still considered young people who did good things in God's service. Jesus left an example of that as well. If you read Luke chapter 2 verses 41 uh, through the end of that chapter, you read about an incident when Jesus was 12 years old and uh, was discussing matters pertaining to the law of Moses with the doctors of the law in the temple area. And there he was uh, asking them questions about the law and discussing the law with them. And the text says that those, uh, those teachers of the law were uh, impressed by the way he handled himself. And when his, uh, when his mother found him there, they'd been searching for him because they thought that he was lost. And when she finally found him there and she asked why he had, uh, you know, put them through that, that bit of misery for them not knowing where he was. And he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2, verse 49. And so Jesus left an example of having a proper emphasis on things spiritual, remembering God in the days of youth. And that's a great example just from the life of, of Jesus. What about Timothy, who was um, one who knew the scriptures from his childhood, a point that we mentioned in a previous lesson. From your childhood you've known the holy scriptures, Paul said to him, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And Timothy played a major uh, role in the church. What about um, uh, the importance of uh, this matter as it relates to making choices. If we realize in youth, in the days of our youth, that we should be seeking God and remembering God and serving God, that will help you as a young person to consistently make good choices. Life is, is composed of making choices. And um, we have to make them uh, every day. Some of them are not real significant. Some of them are. But regardless of the choices that we make, we should desire to make good ones, to make wise choices. 
and recognizing very early on that we have a responsibility to seek God and remember God even in the days of our youth that will help us to uh, develop the good practice of making wise choices like Joseph did in Genesis 39 verse 9 when he was propositioned by Potiphar's wife and he said no I can't do this this great evil and sin against God he already had his mind made up that he was going to serve God and when the opportunity to commit sin was presented to him he rejected it and said no that, that's not the right choice Daniel in Daniel 1 verse 8 had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meats uh, and so he had, he had made up his mind to make a proper and right choice part of remembering God involves respecting parents uh, and if you're going to live a life that's respectful of God then that's going to involve being respectful to your folks in Luke 2 verse 51 the Bible says concerning the young Jesus at age 12 that he was subject to them subject to Mary and Joseph in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 to 3 we find in the New Testament that admonition to children children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth God wants you as a young person to be respectful toward your parents and it's interesting that the reason given for that in Ephesians 6 verses 1 and 2 is simply because it's the right thing to do. Obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Some things are right and some things are wrong uh, just based upon the moral nature of God and laws that proceed from his moral nature. And, uh, and, and that's one of them. God wants you to be obedient to your parents because it's the right thing to do. It's interesting that in Romans chapter 1 verses 29 through 32 uh, Paul lists a number of sins that were consistently committed by the Gentile nations and among those sins were uh, murder and being haters of God and idolatry and things like that well right there in that list is disobedient to parents now if you don't think God takes that seriously then you need to reread that section of Romans chapter 1 God does take it very seriously. And so, as a young person, you need to take it seriously too. So Solomon's advice is enjoy being young, remove evil from your heart, remember God in your youth, and then number four, reflect on what's coming. If you look at uh, the first seven verses of Ecclesiastes 12, and we don't have time to read through all of that, but, uh, but he mentions in verse 1 that there are difficult days ahead. He says you need to make it a practice to remember God in your youth before those difficult days come when you say, I don't have any pleasure in them. I don't have any pleasure in the things that are related to God. Age is going to catch up to you. And uh, though sometimes we think, well, I'll serve God in my later years. I don't want to serve him now. Uh, because I'll, I'll feel more like it then. Solomon is saying you need to develop those habits early before the days come when instead of uh, thinking you'll have time for God, you've developed the habits of not having time for God and then you don't have any pleasure in seeking God. So develop those good habits early because they may not come later. And Solomon uses some interesting word pictures to depict the aging process, these difficult days that he says are going to come. Things like uh, the keepers of the house tremble. Uh, a reference to uh, shaky hands and arms, the strong men bow down, what many believe are references to the, the legs weakening and bending. He says, uh, he speaks of the days when the grinders cease, um, an obvious reference to one's teeth that, uh, that, that, seem, that fall out in old age. Those that look through the windows grow dim, the eyes uh, he mentions the doors being shut, probably hearing loss that he's referencing. Uh, when you rise at the sound of the bird, uh, sleeping problems and getting up uh, very early, fear of heights, he mentions the almond tree blossoming, a reference to the, uh, an almond tree that blossoms is uh, the blossoms are white, and so he's referencing the, the whitening of the hair. So before all those evil days come, he says you need to remember your creator because ultimately man is going to his eternal home, verse 5, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, verse 7. Now all that's not to depress young people, it's simply to impress them with the seriousness of life and that life doesn't go on forever. And you better, while you have the opportunity, make time for God. 
challenges are great to young people today. Temptations are many. Uh, the allurements of the world promise a lot but deliver very little and it causes disillusionment sometimes. We need all the help we can get, young or old. So I encourage you, young person, remember the advice of a man who tried it all. Rejoice in your youth within proper reason. Remove evil from your heart. Remember God and reflect on the future. And remember Paul's admonition of Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back with a free offer. I'm so glad. interested in your money. We're interested in your soul. If you're not a Christian, in order to become one, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, verse 10. And be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2, 38 and Mark 16, 16. I encourage you to do those things if you've not already. If you'd like to have a copy of the lesson that you've seen today, then we'd like for you to have it. You can have it in the form of a DVD, an audio cassette, an audio CD, or a written transcript. All you have to do is contact us. We have an 800 number. It's 800-819-2966. We have an email address, requests at thetruthinlove.com. You can go to our website, www.thetruthinlove.com. Or if you want to send us a postcard or a letter, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. We hope to hear from you soon. Gospel Broadcasting Network. The Gospel Broadcast Network. GBN. Give me the Bible, sorrow and his weeping. Do you know what we're calling to his cause? No storm can hide that greatness which will be me. Since Jesus came to seek and save the lost.
teaching the truth in love, in love, in love. Flashlight. Switch selected. Screen recording.